Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our next conversation with Matthew Gill, we're going to get into more details about the people of Stonehenge. They claim to date from times that predate Judaism. Were they Christians? We'll find out more in our next conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. So, as far as the religious practices, because this predates Abraham and Moses and everything, would, would they be like Christian practices? Would they be Jewish practices? Yeah, they're not. They're not. They won't be Jewish. They won't be Jewish, and they won't be Christian. I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? Because whenever I talk to people about it, I always say, "Well, in the Book of Ether, which isn't." Very, very, very complicated to read. There's very, 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 very few mentions of religious practices. I mean, if you read the Book of Ether, it's like a king's list of who ruled for how long and uh, and who was imprisonable than anyone else. For me, when people say, is it Christian or Jewish? I would say it's neither of those things. It is, it is God. It is religion. It is, it is God. And and I don't think to label it Christian or it certainly wouldn't be Jewish because it predates Judaism. So, and it wouldn't be Christian because it predates Christianity technically, but it would be religion. It would be a group of people who have set practices worshipping the same God that I worship, i.e. Jesus Christ. Which is why I would gather there are differences in the way that they worship Christ to the way I worship Christ. Because a lot of the things I worship Christ are based upon modern revelation, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Mormon. They wouldn't have had those things. So they, their way of worshiping Christ would have been different to, to the way I worship Christ. But it wouldn't have been totally alien to me because it's worshiping Christ. So are there like prophecies about Christ or anything like that in there? No. They're, they talk of Christ a lot in the record. Jaranek, the last prophet of, in the book of Jaranek, he sees a vision of the birth of Christ. Just like Nephi? Yeah, yeah, I suppose, but it's you're later than that. Yeah, it's just like Nephi. He sees that where he will be born, how he will be born, how he will die which confuses him a little in the record because he doesn't realize, he doesn't understand how people can kill a god. But anyway, that's beside the point. He sees the way he dies. He sees that he's resurrected. He knows that's going to happen. And also, one of the good things about the book of Jaranek for me is we know one of the wise men that were at the birth of Christ. So, Who is? <laughs> His name is Sharonek, and he is still knocking around. He hasn't tasted death. He's still here. Oh. And, uh, and he, he was told that he would bring a gift to the birth side uh, or the cradle of Christ. And I happen to believe that there are many, many wise men that went to see Jesus, including the Nephites. So they, they prophesy of Christ, they teach of Christ, they, they worship Christ, they talk about him all the time. And then, of course, skipping forward to the book of Rahman. So these are pre-Jewish Christians. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the things that they do that we would recognize, I mean, I don't know. Baptism probably is probably the most important one, I would think. That we know they baptized in the book of Jaranek because baptisms take place. They weren't like taking the sacrament, but they weren't offering up uh, sacrifice either. So there are certain things that you and I would recognize as the uh, quote unquote Christian practice. So okay. practice. Sacrament? No, no, that's definitely not instituted amongst them at that time. No. Okay. Which would, which would probably make sense as. Christ hasn't been born yet. So, no, no sacrament. No ritual sacrifices of animals, nothing like that. Prayer, we know that they, they pray a heck of a lot. 
and the baptisms. I'm just trying to think of all the stuff in there. There's a, there's a there's a part in the book of Jeremy where they set up for the first time amongst the people a, a religious organization where people can attend and pray and worship and they they call that the church of Christ so they knew about Christ they knew he was going to come forth they believed in him because he'd spoken to the prophets and given them direction. So they call him Christ, not Yeshua or Joshua or Messiah or anything like that. It's it's the Greek Christ. Okay. Now I've got to be, you know, I translated that record, nobody else. So I often say to people, this book is only as good as my translation. I'm sure I'm sure somewhere, maybe, there could have been someone who could have translated it better. But I, I did what I could do and did do. And just like the Book of Mormon, I'm sure if Oliver Cowdery had translated parts of the Book of Mormon, it would have a different tonal inflection than Joseph Smith. That's that. But he couldn't, so he didn't. So there's not a unique translation. Every, every prophet's going to put his own little spin on it? I think every prophet would bring his own loaded ideas or would describe things differently. Like, for example, when I was translating the book of Jeremy, not only did I see text, I saw events and I would describe those events. So those events that I'm describing are only going to be as good as my description. I'm sure if someone else looked at that event, they might pick something else out. Okay, so... Because I know Joseph used the seer stone as well as the Urim and Thummim. So you've got these red and blue spectacles, and you're seeing, are you, you're seeing those on the spectacles? I mean, they kind of sound like 3D glasses in a way. Nah. Yeah, people have said that to me before. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would put them on, and then I would look at the text, if you like. Look at the plates. Look at the plates, and then... I would see uh, above the line of inscription a translation into my English. Because don't forget, my English is different to your English too. We That's have a right. common language, it's totally different. <laughs> we spell things differently for a start. Yeah. You spelled all wrong. <laughs> so, I, so I saw the text above the line that I was looking at. But then... How do you describe this? When the text won't do, when the text doesn't doesn't describe it richly enough, I saw through those uh, glasses. Like a vision, kind of. Like a vision uh, of a scene of something. For example, there's a battle in the book of Jonah, which takes place in the middle of the book. And I was struggling whilst translating that to emphasize just how bad it was because i was seeing the words and then i was trying to these guys were like, what, do you, what do you mean how bad was it and i'm like i don't know uh, i'm just reading this and then because of that i would see a snap uh, a vision of the battle site and the battle scene and i would describe that to them and then that would help them with the text for example there's a part in it which says that all the followers of christ wore red into battle as a sign of the coming Christ and his ultimate sacrifice in the world. They were read into battle. Well, the text didn't say that on the plates. It, issued, it told me they, were, they wore colour, but it didn't tell me what colour. And when we translated them, they said, what colour? What colour? I, I, I don't know. It's not in the text. So, then at that time, I would see a vision and I would see, okay, they were wearing red into battle. They were wearing red at the battle site. And they would go, okay, well, that makes sense to us. That solved the colorage. They were wearing red. Okay. And then 
it was a it was the translation was a was a bit of both. It was a word translation, i.e., the English would be above the characters, the descriptions, and then sometimes I would see a vision and I would describe the vision. That's how it went for me, and it's exactly the same way it went to translate the new book in two thousand and fifteen. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. Oh, I lost my train of thought there. Oh, so I know, especially with regards to Stonehenge, the scientists have said they were druids. Were these people druids? No, they were predated the dru- druid religion. However, it is my belief and understanding that druidism came about after the fall of the people and it was a direct consequence of the old priesthood, the old um, power of God and it translated and formed itself into Druidism. But Druidism wasn't their religion, no. And so these people weren't Druids. What did they call themselves? They weren't Nephites, they weren't Lamanites? No, they called themselves uh, the, the, they called themselves three things. The children, the, the children of Light, the children of Aranek, who was the very first prophet, or the children of Christ. That was it, or the people of Christ. That's the only three names they use, and they use those names interchangeably throughout the record. People of Light, the children of Aranek, or the children of Christ. That's it, or the people of Christ. So could we just for short call them Christians? Yeah, if you like. Oh, okay. <laughs> if, if that makes it easier for people to understand yes they were okay. practicing some sort of christianity post christ pre-christ pre-christ christianity okay which is not a difficult thing to understand comprehend given given and um, this is a big debating issue of course given the fact that the book of ether predated christ and so who did they have the war the final battle with Oh, okay. I've been at this right. So, the the children of Aranek, the people of Jaranek, the children of Christ, they had their final battle. Remember that I told you about a brother that went into Russia called Lionek. Okay, L I O N E K. L I O N E C K. E C K. Okay. They eventually, for various reasons, make their way to Great Britain and they had a clash of cultures. A Russian invasion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's done his worst. <laughs> but, yeah, if you like, a, a, a marauding Russian invasion from the east. Okay. So and then they and when when they get to eat when they get to Great Britain, there's a big clash of cultures because you got one culture on the one hand that's Worshipping Christ and being righteous, I suppose. And this culture that comes from somewhere else that isn't practicing Christianity, that isn't worshipping Christ, and the two, the two but. Because these were essentially sons of, or people like Jer- the Jaredites, right, in Russia, but they just apostatized, basically, and... Yeah, when Lionette was when Lionette was refused the mantle of prophet from his father, he took two thousand people with him into the east. I say the east because we can't be too sure how far east, but he took them in the east, that'd be Russia somewhere, and then set up his own society. And then over time, through different stories in the Book of Jaronet, which we can read about, he finds out about the people in Great Britain and. Over generations and generations, they keep this hatred alive in their hearts to, to destroy them. And they come eventually and they invade and they destroy and they murder and they kill. So they don't take over all of the countries in between Russia, like Germany and. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. The, all, all you know is they came to the British Isles. Yeah, they came, they came through those countries. We'll be assumed they came through the. So the, the thing about Lion X line is there isn't a lot written in the book of Jaronek about it other than to say that he existed and that he was not a nice man and, and that his people were wicked. So there isn't, we don't, obviously he came through Europe 
but we don't know the ins and outs of how he... Of what happened. Okay. But just somehow he ended up in the British Isles and then they had a final battle and the bad guys won. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> bad knowledge triumph. There are 10 remaining followers of Christ with the prophet Jeremiah in the temple at Stonehenge. And eventually they all get killed. And then the seed of Lionette basically stay and they interbreed and intermingle with other people that come to the British Isles. So, um, yeah. And the Druids came after that? Is that what you're saying? Came after that, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe the Druids were just their way their way of uh, trying to explain this pre-Christian type religion that they couldn't explain. So they used some of those aspects that they didn't really understand and it formed itself into a religion called Druidism, which is slightly explained a little bit more in the book of Rayanet. Rayanet, okay. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Elder Matthew Gill. In our next conversation, we're going to talk more about the LDS Church's suit against Matthew to try to shut him down. Vix gets kicked upstairs in the LDS Church to someone who makes a big decision. And then at one, one day, I'll, I come home uh, from taking my boys out, and I've got this big envelope with the LDS Church stamped all over it. And I'm like, oh. And then they go, we're going to sue you. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, our sites, I mean, we're not huge and we don't have lots of money, so you don't want to get much. And so we went to a, a lawyer and we got lawyered up as best as we could. Thanks for listening to Gospel Tangents. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please subscribe at patreon.com slash gospel tangents. You can hear the entire interviews there. Also, check out our new, improved, uh, user-friendly website at gospeltangents.com. We've made it much more user-friendly, so check that out. Click here to subscribe, here for a transcript, and over here we've got more of our great videos. Thanks again.